Look, uncommitted got 13%. That's not nothing. But in 2012, where there was no big uncommitted campaign against that incumbent president, Barack Obama, uncommitted got 11%. Now, I'm not a big mathematician, but 11% and 13%. I don't have the budget for a giant touchscreen TV to do pundit math on, but I do have a pen and paper. So let's do some pundit math. In 2024, in the Democratic primary in Michigan, uncommitted received 13%. This uncommitted vote being part of an effort to scare the Biden administration into discontinuing the U.S.'s support for the assault on Gaza, in which Israel has killed about 30,000 people. Others have speculated the number could be as high as 200,000. In 2012, the last election in which a Democrat, Obama, was up for re-election, 11% voted uncommitted. Those numbers are pretty close. And actually, in 2008, about 40% voted uncommitted in the Democratic primary. And as a matter of fact, in 1996, 86% voted uncommitted in Michigan. Now, I can understand why someone might look at the 2012 number and think, well, what happened in 2024 isn't terribly unusual. I do not understand, however, how a data person at a national news agency could look at those numbers and think they're comparable because they're not. Those numbers are for completely different reasons. They have nothing to do with each other. The 2012 number is as irrelevant as the 2008 number and the 96 number. I will explain. Now, Michigan might have been the first state in the uncommitted campaign, but since then, hundreds of thousands have voted uncommitted around the country, routinely outperforming all the other Democratic candidates combined. And we're not done with primaries yet. Some people are unmoved by this. Some voters logged protest votes against President Biden on Super Tuesday, but in many places, proportionally, it was a smaller share than in 2012. Obama, you will recall, won re-election. But the uncommitted vote in 2024 does say something serious and unique and could absolutely help inform how the general election is gonna go. Now you might have heard people say something like, Michigan is a purple state. We are a state that frequently votes uncommitted. And yeah, it does, kind of. In 1996, in the Democratic primary, 123,000 people voted uncommitted in Michigan. In 1996, Michigan switched to an open primary, in addition to holding a caucus. However, the National Democratic Party didn't recognize open primaries for presidential elections, so all the candidates removed their names from the ballot. The options in the primary that year, vote uncommitted or write in a name. And so uncommitted got 86% and the other 14% were write-ins. 2008 in the Michigan Democratic primary, that's an interesting year because that year saw 238,000 people vote uncommitted, almost 40% of the vote. And that's because that year Michigan tried to challenge the DNC rule. See, Michigan wanted to have more influence. So they moved their primary earlier that year to January 15th, which was before Super Tuesday. But there were only four states allowed to vote before Super Tuesday, and Michigan was not one of them. So in response to this, pretty much everyone took their name off the ballot. So if you wanted to vote for Edwards or Obama or Biden, you had to vote uncommitted. So in those elections, the option to vote uncommitted was a way to vote for someone who, for whatever reason, wasn't on the ballot. But as a protest vote, there was a lot more to this. And this is actually an important topic that is generally underexplored. The option to vote for none of the above is something I think everyone should have the right to do. This year, the entire country saw that in the Republican primary in Nevada, Nikki Haley was defeated by none of these candidates. I don't think there is anything that could possibly represent the spirit of Nikki Haley's participation in the Republican primary this year better than this image. But none of these candidates is on all of Nevada's ballots, and none of these candidates has won in the past. In 2014, in the Democratic primary for governor, Nevada Democrats chose none of these candidates. There's actually been an effort to remove this option from the ballot because supposedly it disenfranchises voters through its spoiler effect. And generally speaking, I think the spoiler effect and labeling certain candidates as spoilers is a really toxic element in our political discourse. However, if we're being generous, it can be at least an accurate diagnosis if you are truly talking about someone whose voters might plausibly draw from someone else. So, in the case of RFK, for example, I think a number of his supporters would vote for Trump. Whereas someone voting for Cornell West is less likely to vote for Biden no matter what. But let's think about someone who votes for none of these candidates. If you are so dissatisfied with everyone on the ballot that you put on clothes, you get in your car, you drive to your polling place just to mark on your ballot 
that you hate your options and ostensibly don't care who wins. You're only showing up to register your dissatisfaction. If that person goes to vote and realizes they can't choose none of these candidates, their vote would probably go to a candidate who didn't have much of a chance to win anyway, and for sure, you're removing the ballot option that actually represented that person's desires, which is some way of expressing non-consent. But on the occasion when none of these candidates does well or even wins, it certainly has a delegitimizing effect, which I assume is a reason people have tried to get this option removed from the ballot in Nevada since this option has no actual consequence. Because what happens if none of these candidates wins, the election then defaults to the person who came in second. So in 2014, the 30% who voted none of these candidates were tossed aside and the election went to this guy. Where this would really become a threat is in the case where a vote of non-consent had actual consequences. Now, there are places where a none of the above vote would trigger a new election. In Colombia, for example, if a blank vote receives a simple majority, not only does it trigger a new election, all of the candidates on the ballot are precluded from participating in that new election. How do you think that would change the political landscape in the US if we knew that we could go to the polls in November, vote blank, and then get a new election where neither Trump nor Biden were allowed to run. Leave a comment. Do you think in such a scenario, blank would win? Because I can't even fathom such a hypothetical if people thought that the current candidates amounted to an etch-a-sketch they could shake in November. But for right now, how you'd express your dissatisfaction is by voting third party, alternative candidates, or by staying home, or in the states where you can, voting uncommitted or none of the above. Would you consider voting uncommitted? Love it, respect it, encourage it, help people do it. No, I can understand why people want to, but I won't be. Why not? Yeah, yeah. Honestly, too, the, I mean, the whole situation there is, is horrible. I'm just not informed enough to be able to commit or not commit, but what can you do with your vote that would actually make a difference? Yeah, during the primary, I get it. I would consider it in, in yeah. the primary. 11% in 2012, 13% in 2024, What's the difference? Way fewer people have voted uncommitted against Joe Biden this time than did against Barack Obama in 2012. Which means that this time around is also immaterial. It also means that the other uncommitted votes in other states are probably not worth paying attention to. This is incorrect. Dearborn, Michigan has a huge Arab population. In 2012, their congressional district voted 13% uncommitted. There was no effort to unite in an uncommitted vote, and so Dearborn's district voted uncommitted at the same rate every other place did. Whereas in 2024, they voted 57% uncommitted. Now, after all the death in Gaza, and the knowledge that the US is doing things like authorizing the transfer of $2.5 billion of warplanes and weapons to Israel, which includes 1,800 MK-84 2,000 pound bombs, now the use of a 2,000 pound bomb can amount to a war crime because the blast radius is so big. For an example of the deadly reach this bomb has, here is Yankee Stadium, and here is where you would not want to be. Whereas aid to Gaza, as of March 7th, was only $180 million. And so in 2024, Uncommitted got 101,000 votes in Michigan, or 13.2%. Alternative ways you could compare 2024 to 2012, 101,000 votes for uncommitted, Obama only got 174,000 votes in 2012. But I think the most useful comparison is this. 20 years ago in 2004, Kerry won Michigan by 160,000. 2016 was famously close. Trump won by 11,000 votes. And in 2020, Biden won by 154,000 votes. So this number is pretty close to the margin of victory in an important state it just so happens, because of this uncommitted vote, people have the chance to use the Democratic primary for something other than participating in a predetermined outcome. Which is to say that because the numbers are big enough, because there is a big enough campaign, you can register a vote of non-consent and be heard in a way that you normally can't. And in 2024, it would seem this is the most effective way to use the Democratic primary to actually say something. And that will do it for me. My name is Spencer Snyder. If you found this video interesting, make sure you are subscribed to Breaking Points. You can also check out my YouTube channel where I talk about media and politics and things. Link in the description. Liking and sharing always helps. Thank you to Breaking Points. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.